you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I should read some scripture to begin with this morning, beginning in verse 1 through verse 7. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as we are called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why we say when he ascended on high, he led captives into this train and gave gifts unto men. When you look at this scripture, and we've been preaching through the book of Ephesians, he's talking about the importance of being one having unity in the body of Christ. We see uh, in our nation today um, a lot of disunity. We see a lot of problems. We see a lot of hatred, and we see a lot of people saying things they should not be saying, both on the left and on the right. We've got an election coming up uh, this Tuesday. I was reading through um, Decision Magazine put out by the Billy Graham Association, and they're talking about that this election is probably one of the most important ones in our nation at this point in time. And the unfortunate thing is we see a lot of problems, not only in our nation, even in the church. And What we see here as we read the scriptures, Paul said, we need to keep the unity in the bond of peace. And Jesus made this statement. He said, a house divided will not stand. Made that statement twice in the Bible. And one thing that we want to see in this local church and in the churches that we fellowship with and every other week in my office, uh, our church gets together with Three churches just down the road from us, and then one church further over in Woodstock. And I can say to you, and and that's a representation not only of a non-denominational church, which we are, but Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, that we found more in common, and we know we're better together than apart. And so I, I see, in spite of what's happening in the world and even in a lot of churches, even our nation, that yet the Spirit of God is moving and bringing us together. And we're focusing on things that we can agree and not disagree. We can always find things to disagree. We can uh, even have disagreement here concerning our eschatology, concerning the end times. We can have uh, in the body of Christ disagreement on the mode of baptism as far as do we sprinkle, do we immerse, or what? And, you know, we can disagree on do angels have wings or not. Dinah thinks angels have wings. I don't think they do. And we have big fights over that. <laughs> they hadn't, hadn't got anyone in the kingdom. <laughs> uh, I, my scripture I use, uh, we entertain angels unaware. Meaning, if I see wings on them, oh, that's an angel. But then the guy just walks in and you probably heard this, you know, that was strange because I don't know where that person came from or where they went, but they spoke to me and it looked just like another person. Possibly could have been an angel. So I said, see, Diana? Huh? Hello? And he talks about, in the Old Testament, seraphims and things that had these wings and flying around. And I said, anyway, so you can see how we can find things to disagree on. But I want to say we can find things more to agree on than disagree, amen? And the pastors that I meet with, we agree that one of the most important things doctrinally is the doctrine of salvation. It's not by works. 
Hallelujah. It's a gift. It's not based upon how we look or how smart we are or this or that. Salvation is based upon the fact it's the power of God on the salvation of the Jew and the, the Greek, meaning he encompasses every single person. Amen? And the thing is that when God puts his stamp of approval in, in the book of Revelation, we see that God puts his mark on us. He seals us, not to lose us, but to keep us. Amen? That doesn't give you and me the privilege to go out here and to say, oh, I'm going to continue to sense of grace may more abound, God forbid. But because we know God loves us, we want to stay in unity with him and one another. Amen? Now, I, I can sit down with my pastor friends and we talk about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and we can start to disagree on the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And some will agree, some will disagree. I'm not going to make a fight over that. Amen? No one, it says in the book of Corinthians, can call Jesus Lord except by the Spirit of God. When you come to Christ, the Holy Ghost comes and takes residence within you. Amen? And then he wants to manifest himself, and he does. Some people prophesy the Word of God. Some people speak in an unknown tongue and then interpret. Some people have a manifestation of the helps of God or an evangelistic gift or an exhortation. The list goes on and on and on. It talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit, but God's not limited by those nine gifts. Some have a word of wisdom, some healing, faith. Amen? I want everything that God has for me. You do too. I'm not going to let my dogmatism or my theological mindset keep me from experiencing what God has for me. And, and I'm not going to let my blessing of God become a stumbling block for another brother or sister. I'm not going to get on the idea, neither I believe are you, that we have this elitism because some people want to say, well, I've got a corner on the market. God does speaks to me, but he doesn't speak to you or some crazy thing like that. I want to say that God is speaking to each and every one of us every day. One of the main ways that God communicates with you through the Word. Amen? And when I, when I develop my theology, when you develop your theology, you're thinking about God, you want to base it on the truth of God's Word. There's a lot of good stuff in here. Amen? And I'm still ever learning. You are too. Even though I've walked with the Lord for a number of years and read the Bible and preached the Bible, there's still things in there that I say, I don't quite get a handle on that. But I'm not going to become so arrogant or so high-minded. I'm going to let it become a problem between me and another believer in Christ. Amen? One of the profound things, and there's only a few blanks for you to fill in today. Hopefully you have a copy of today's message. As believers, we want to be obedient to the Word of God. And Paul was encouraging the church of Corinth here. He says, to walk worthy of your calling. God has a calling for every person here. I don't care if you've known the Lord just one year or known the Lord for years. Everyone has a calling. Everyone has a place, a purpose in the church and we all need to be involved in doing that. Amen? You're not supposed to be exactly like me, or am I like to be exactly like you? Amen? Some people are more extroverted, some are introverted. I'm one of those people that I'm kind of like, when I was in the Air Force, we had these bombers, and and some of these planes we had were armed with a heat-seeking missile. And a thing that would kind of nerve you or upset you when you walk by, you see that missile, <laughs> picking up on you. That thing, wait a minute. 
I hope someone doesn't push that button, you know. And, uh, but what I kind of like a heat-seeking missile, I'm always, I don't, I, this is part of my makeup, my gifting and calling. I look for people that I can speak to about Jesus. I guess that evangelistic calling. And I, I just, that's one of the predominant things in my, in my life. That's not so with Diana. She's, she's more, she's a writer, an editor. She's more the behind the scenes a person. And we, we need that gifting. We, we need everyone working together so we don't want to say, well, you're not acting like me, so you really can't be a part of me. Listen, we are all been gifted and called to God. We need to walk worthy of that, Paul says. We need to keep the, the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace, and we need to work together as a team. Can you say amen? And I think that's happening in our community, other churches. We, we might have some differences, but it's not worth having an argument or a fight over, so we need to come together and pool our resources, our time, our talents, our gifts, our finances and work together. When I went to Ukraine recently, uh, Hope Church in Corning, New York, and our church, we work together. It's like a team. We're able to be a blessing and take our resources, our finances, and pull them together and give all the glory to God. Not our church or their church, but all the glory goes on to the Lord. Amen? And so... What we want to do is be sure that we don't compromise the Word of God. We don't compromise our convictions, but we work together. And the foundational doctrine of Christ that the churches that we connect with and fellowship with are all saying amen, and we come together and agree in the name of Jesus. There's a guy named Tom Rayner. He works with Lifeway, a Southern Baptist publishing house. He does a lot of other work writing. Uh, he uh, deals with a lot of relevant issues, writes books and things of this nature. And I don't know him, but I read some of his books and materials. Uh, he spoke at some of the uh, churches that uh, we fellowship with. And he lists 14 causes of disunity in the church. And the reason I bring this to your attention, if there's anything on here that is happening. I don't want to be a part of anything that's causing disunity. I want to be a part of something that's bringing the body of Christ together. So this is a, a sermon to kind of like a preventive measure. Uh, let's, you know, take the medicine ahead of time and make sure that we don't involve ourselves in anything that would cause a break in fellowship within the church, within our families. Amen? And so, he lists 14 things here. Now, I'm not going to preach a sermon on each and every one of them because I'd probably lose a few people, might fall asleep or whatever, and I'd have to do something crazy to get your attention, like hit the pulpit or something like that or, or a pause or a yell or something, you know. I've done that before, not recently. I saw someone kind of dozing, and and so I kind of moved from the platform down there and just walked over near there and just yelled and kind of put it within my message and oh, the person came alive. I believe in resurrection life. Amen. So, so you look at this list here and just go through this very quickly. Gossip. We don't need that, do we? I've been guilty of that. Have you ever been guilty of gossiping? And we know, we, you know, I wish I hadn't said that. Yeah, I wish those, you know, that old rhyme is, sticks or stones that break my bones, but words that never hurt me. That's a lie. You get over a stick or stone a lot easier than you can someone saying to you, you know what, as far as I'm concerned in my life, you don't exist. That's not nice. Or you tell a person that they're dumb or stupid. Or you say, you know, they're, they're not really born of God. Look at the way they dress. Look at 
this. Look at that. That is not of God. That's a ploy of the enemy. And, you know, what we need, if we're doing that, we need to own it and ask God to forgive us and get our act together. Amen? Actions cloaked in darkness. That means like an Absalom spirit. Doing things behind the scenes undermine the authority. Absalom was a favorite son of David. And he had a sinister mindset. And what he did, he stood at the entrance gate to the city and when people come in with their problem or something, he said, hey, I'll listen to you. I'm a good listener. He said, if I was a king, I wouldn't do that. He was undermining his own father to the point where David had to flee Jerusalem to save his life. And then David's commander-in-chief, I think it was Joab, that went to war against Absalom and his followers. And it said that Absalom had this long hair. And in the midst of this fray, this battle, he got caught in a tree. I think it was Joab put three darts into his heart. Even though Absalom was doing this atrocious thing, undermining the authority of his dad, David grieved over the loss of his son's life and even caused him to search deep within his own heart and mind. God, I'm being falsely accused by Shimei who is following along, hurling out these adjectives and pronouncing judgment upon me. And Joab said, you want me to go up there and kill that dirty dog? He said, no, maybe there's a message in this that I need to hear. See, David, even though he made some mistakes, he was smart that he went not for the head of God, he went for the heart of God. So I, you know, I say, God, deal with my heart. Help me, God, not to get caught up in trying to undermine your authority to speak things that shouldn't be spoken. I want to do the right thing. I want to be part of the answer, the solution, and not the problem. Amen? Self-serving church member, my way or the highway. And over the years, we've had people who come in and, and very knowledgeable, good people, but they had an agenda, and they wanted this local body to adjust our vision, to adjust our calling, to fit in what they felt that God had called them to do. And we're not going to change what God has called us to do because someone from the outside comes in and says, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to preach. <laughs> People critique me, which is all right. My sermon said, well, if I was preach that sermon, I'd use this scripture, this scripture, this scripture. And I said, well, I didn't have time to read the whole Bible. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and lovingly, you know, say something to them. Lack of prayer, being fragmented over special interests. You know, we need to realize that we call ourselves prayer and praise Christian fellowship. We do have a corporate prayer meeting on Sunday night. It meets here at 6. And I'm not saying everyone has to be in attendance. I want you to come not because you feel obligated. I want you to come because you need to pray. We need to come together and pray. When I meet with my pastor friends at the close of our meeting, we each go around and we spend a good block of time just praying for one another. Had a new fellow joined our group recently, an older gentleman, and he said, can I come and be a part of your Barnabas group? He says, I'm lonely. I, I need some good fellowship. And so uh, Phil sent out an email, and each of us responded, and one of our good pastor friends said, no way, JK. And I said, what? You know, just kidding. <laughs> so, and I mean, so we reached out to this this guy who has a ministry, 
in the community, uh, going to nursing homes and assisted living and just reaching out to people, a lot of people who've been forgotten and just thrown away, and spend time with them, just encouraging me and speaking into their life. Spirit-filled guy, loves God. So yeah, come on in, you can be a part of us. And so, not self-serving members, we're here to be a blessing and encourage one another. Can you say amen? Fear of confrontation. Knowing there is a problem, but refusing to deal with No one likes confrontation. If you do, there's something wrong with you. But sometimes, we need to confront one another. And a lot of times, we don't want to do that. Because it's not a comfortable thing. It's not an easy thing to do, but you have to do that. Jesus used neuthetic counseling. He was confrontational. He dealt with the Pharisees and Sadducees, didn't he? He used some adjectives that weren't, you know, <laughs> necessarily, but he was speaking the truth. And he, he dealt with people. He, he would, remember the woman who was caught in act of adultery? What about the guy? Where was he? And then he, he confronted him. He who is without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. Started from the oldest to the youngest and gradually just moved away, realized when strong conviction came upon them, they realized that they were guilty. You know, we said, well, I've never committed that sin. In our hearts and minds, all of us have broken the Ten Commandments. In our mind. Have you ever killed someone? No, but maybe in your mind you thought, God, would you please do me a favor? Whack them. You know, now I want to. I've thought that, you know. I mean, <laughs> and I said, God, forgive me. And when you start looking at the Ten Commandments, you go down the list. Each one of us in our mind. That's one of the most difficult things for us to bring under control is our thought life. And so here, here's what I want to do, and I say, God help me that when I look at you, because each and, and every one of us can be cynical and find something wrong with this person or that. I want to look on the good things. I want to look on the best part of you. And all of us are broken. All of us have issues to deal with. But when I look at you, you say, well, that person has great qualities. That person's gifted. That person is moving in with God's call. And let's look at those things. Amen? Amen. Um, we don't want to be careful that we don't adopt the hypocritical spirit of the culture. And nowadays you see where people are being bullied and attacked on social media. That's sad. To the point where you hear about a young man up at Sequoia High School who had some uh, mental and physical impairments. A young guy, I think he was a junior in high school, where he was infatuated by this young lady and went over and just started a conversation and said, would you like to have, you know, a time where we could have coffee or talk or a soda or whatever? And this young girl, probably in a, a popular, attractive girl, looked at him and said, you know, you, you're worthless. You don't. You're not significant. You have no future. That went right to the center of his being. He went home and committed suicide. Yikes. I don't want to be in people's basement. I want to be in their balcony. Amen? That was an ungodly, cruel thing. And that young person, that young woman... We'll have to live with that the rest of her life. Sad. Low expectations. We need to place more importance on membership and accountability. That's why we have a newcomers class. I want people to know what this church is about, what we believe, what we stand for, what our values are. What, you know, makes us tick. We're not, we don't have a form of legalism, but we what we want to say is we are here together 
as people of God, the children of the Lord, and what we want to say is that every person is important, every person is significant, and we want to come together that we can be used of God to reach the people that he brings us into contact with in our community and beyond. Can you say amen? A lack of church discipline. Now that's a tough one right there. The church of Corinth was had believers, but they were condoning allowing something that was well known that there was a young man who was sleeping with his stepmother. And they just did this. And Paul called them on the carpet for not confronting this person and disciplining them. Now, the purpose of discipline is not to hurt people, but to bring them re to repentance. Amen? And in our, our assembly, if we see something that needs to be dealt with, we don't stand up in front of the church and say, so-and-so has a problem, da-da-da-da, you know. We privately take that person in and confront them and pray for God to deal with their heart, to bring repentance, and they get their house in order. Can you say amen? Is that a good thing? Amen? Churches knowing more about what they're against than what they are for. We've got to be careful. There are things that we need to be cautious and warn people about, but we need to look on the bright side of things and not on the negative things. Amen? Fear of losing members. <laughs> I remember uh, in the church I grew up in, a good church, in some ways we learned, leaned towards legalism where we exempted people because they didn't meet certain criteria. I remember this man from, uh, I don't know if he came directly from Italy, but his descendants did. And so the way he was raised, he had a little wine when he had his meal. And he didn't drink wine in excess, but it was just part of his culture a tradition in his family. But this man was a good man. In fact, his son now is the mayor of the small town north of us who's at, still active in that church, but his father never could meet the qualification of the deacon because he drank a little wine. But they took his tithe and offering. Biblically, he's not disqualified. It says, don't drink wine in excess. Now, I don't drink wine because I don't see anything good about it. I've tasted it. I just, ah. But I drink grape juice. We have communion. Now, when I was in Bulgaria, we had communion in Bulgaria. It was a great church, small church. I mean, they were alive, full of the Spirit of God, worshiped the Lord, jumping all over the place, had a great time, had communion. I had a, they had a you know, the big glass of it. It opened my nostrils, cleaned my sinuses out, and I felt happy, you know. <laughs> now, was that wrong? No. In fact, I went to the preacher's house. We sit there. We had uh, dinner after church outside, and he had like this uh, canopy uh, just full of grapes. You could reach up and take a handful of grapes. It was in the month of September. So I guess they had the wine was flowing there. That church was alive. I told the Ukrainian church, you need some joy. Hallelujah. But, you know, fear losing members, we've got to do what God's word says and do what's right. Amen? And if we see something that's definitely unbiblical, not in the word of God, we need to deal with it. Amen? Amen? Failure to be evangelistic. It's impossible to be evangelistic if we're not on the same page, if we're divided. And we have a responsibility to nurture the pastor, the local church, but at the same time, encourage people to go out in highways and byways to let God use you. When you see the Spirit of God at work, you need to join the Lord and have the boldness to speak into their lives. I like, where's Gilda? There's Gilda right there. Gilda has a gift of evangelism. She'll meet someone 
Are you saved? The guy says, I'm not drowning. What are you talking about? But not necessarily that. But Gilda has that boldness that she'll lovingly confront people and talk to them about their need for the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Gilda. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to um, not get involved in power groups. And believe it or not, um, one of my pastor friends in his church, it's a battle. There's people in there who think they own the church. It's a power group. And they are usurping the authority of the leadership of that church and trying to get that church to do what they want to do. And that person, that group of people, they need to have a Holy Ghost encounter with Jesus and need to repent of that and move away from that. Power structure. Don't need that. That brings disunity. And then the, the last one, silent groups that let evil exist because they're afraid to confront it. We're not going to let that. We're not going to be silent. We are going to preach the gospel. Not only here, but as we go out in the highways and byways in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? In the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to be sent up over the years, not recently, but people said, Pastor Baker, keep your message within the four walls of your church. Don't come down here into our city. Don't come down here in Atlanta and start making a proclamation of God's word. When I hear that, that's that gives me a green light, not to do things in an ungodly, forceful manner, but to speak the truth in love. Can you say amen? Now, Tom Rainer mentions eight simple steps that can preserve church unity. Make prayer and scripture the focus of your corporate meeting. Amen? Whatever we do, do it as unto the glory of the Lord. Preach and teach about church unity. We're better together than being apart and separate. Put others before yourselves. Now, that's a real challenge. I mentioned that in my newcomer's class. The thing we need to do for God to empower, to grace us, to be willing to step back in true joy is Jesus first, others second, you last. Amen? And one thing that gives longevity to a marriage, to any relationship, is to honor the other person. In the book of 1 Peter, it talks about a man honoring his wife. It says, to give this analogy, a man is like an old coffee mug. You can take him and toss him around, this or that, you know. Um, go to the refrigerator, instead of taking the milk out and pour it in a glass, look around, Diana's not there, take it, just drink it right there. I don't have to wash that cup. That's the old mug. But with the woman, it's a fine piece of china. You got to take it out. You got to pour the tea in the glass. You got to hold your finger like that. You got to drink it just right, you know. <laughs> so as a man honors his wife, he treats her like a fine piece of china. And he says to her, what can I do to make your life better? What can I do to make things more comfortable? How can I serve you? It's not like a guy comes in and it's Archie Bunker. What was it he called his wife? A dingbat. Yeah, that wasn't nice, was it? <laughs> that, that is not honoring your spouse. You're a dingbat, you know. The same like, well, I'm going back in time as some of the young people say, what is he talking about? Ralph Cramden, the honeymooners. <laughs> Wayne knows. Wayne, don't fall asleep tonight. <laughs> and so, what gives longevity to a relationship, even within the body of Christ, what we need to do is God grace us, gives us the power to prefer others over ourselves. If you want to be great in the kingdom, be what? Servant of all. Can you say amen? Talk to people, not about people. That is a real challenge. Amen? 
be part of the change you want to see. Stand up for the leadership of your church. Be willing to not always get your way if it means advancing the mission. Sometimes you just step back, take a back seat. Amen? Don't compare your church to one down the road. We're all part of the body of Christ. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 says, Before God's throne, there was a multitude that couldn't be numbered from every tribe, every nation, speak from different languages. We're all part of the body of Christ. There's no Jew or Gentile, no male or female, no bond, or no necessarily compared to a free person. We're all one in the body of Christ. Amen? Now, I want you to think about something. And I mentioned 14 reasons for disunity and then mentioned eight steps to preserve church unity. What do you think, and you can write this down for your own purposes. Also, fill in the blank. What do you think is the main reason for disunity in the church? Not necessarily our church, it could be, but the church at large. What do you think is the main reason for disunity in the church today? Because there are churches who are fighting. They're complaining, bickering, going against each other. So just write that down. What do you think? Secondly, what do you think is the primary thing we can do to keep unity in the body of Christ? You might want to write that down. Now here's what I said. Here's what came to my mind. I think one of the most damaging things in the church at large today is gossiping. I think the thing I think we can do, the primary thing to preserve unity in the body of Christ is to put others before ourselves. That is not our human nature. Our human nature is to protect ourselves. Self-preservation. But if we want to be Christ-like, we need to say, God, help me to be your disciple and your follower. Jesus set the example of preferring others over yourself when he took a bowl of water and a towel, knelt down. This is God in the flesh. And washed the feet of his disciples. Wow. I want to have that character. I want to be able to live my life to do that. Can you say amen to that? If that's true, please stand to your feet.